1957, Russia launched Sputnik 1, the first artificial satellite and the first human-made object to orbit Earth. This marked the beginning of the famous space race between the United States and Russia, culminating with the American Apollo mission, landing the first man on the moon in 1969. Eleven more people walked on the moon with the final mission date in 1972, officially ending the space race. Fast forward 50 years and the news is filled again with talk of space agencies, reusable rockets, space tourism, satellite constellations, space stations and Mars rovers. So what happened? Was a new space race launched? And if there is a space race, who is racing who? And importantly, why? Are we to abandon Earth at some point? Or how can space exploration make life better here on Earth? So what's actually going on in space? Let's proceed in order, from close to Earth and moving progressively further away. Earth's orbit is defined as the place where objects are gravitationally attracted to Earth's mass, but can avoid falling if moving fast enough. Closer or slower objects will crash to Earth, and beyond Earth's orbit, objects will drift away with momentum. We begin with low Earth orbit, which is defined as between 160 and 2000 kilometers from Earth. Since Sputnik 1 in 1957, about 10,000 low Earth orbit satellites from 40 countries have been launched. 6,000 of these are still in orbit and 3,000 are still operational. Just 24 of these satellites run a system you are very familiar with, called the Global Positioning System or GPS. GPS began in 1978 as a US Department of Defense project and the system was made accessible to civilians in the 1980s. Because GPS is still a US defense system, access can be revoked at any time, so other countries have developed their own positioning systems and satellites. Besides positioning, the two other main applications for artificial satellites are satellite imaging for military and civilian use and satellite communication to relay data for radio, telephone, television, internet, scientific and military uses. Out of the 3,000 currently operational satellites, over 1,000 are communication satellites. Commercial companies such as SpaceX, OneWeb and Amazon are in the process of creating satellite mega constellations in low orbit to provide global broadband internet coverage to the customers. SpaceX alone has put 1,565 of its Starlink satellites into a very low orbit as of May 2021. They are currently attempting to deploy 60 new satellites per week. The objective is to get 42,000 satellites into orbit within the next eight years to achieve total global internet access. The Falcon 9 partially reusable rocket that is used to launch these small satellites is an incredible piece of technology itself. Stage 1 of the rocket boosts Stage 2 into orbit before returning to Earth and landing vertically on a drone ship. Despite all the excitement, there are also pressing concerns. These constellations of tens of thousands of satellites are making it impossible to perform astronomical observations without getting sunlight reflections. SpaceX has volunteered to help find a solution by coating the satellites or orienting them differently. But these solutions do not change the fact that 42,000 small satellites will alter all of humanity's experience of the night sky. And that is just one company. These issues would be better addressed by an international body representing all of us, rather than by private companies with good intentions and vested interests. While all this technological progress and global internet sound great, you might be wondering what happens to the non-operational satellites? Well, some of them fall out of orbit and burn up, mostly on their way back down to Earth. However, satellites that do not deorbit maintain their low Earth orbit speeds, exceeding 11,000 km per hour. The sheer number of dead satellites means that they are likely to collide with each other and break up in small pieces, which in turn go faster and collide with more pieces. It is estimated that 200 million small pieces of debris, smaller than one centimeter, are currently in low orbit, some of them traveling at speeds exceeding 28,000 km per hour. Active satellites and spacecraft must carefully avoid these flying bullets. 
Tracking and collecting debris will be a monumental effort which will need to be tackled sooner rather than later. Because space is unregulated and belongs to everyone, there is no law or governing body ensuring that this happens. Further from low orbit, satellites that require more accurate positioning are in geosynchronous orbit. There are just 402 of these, so they are a lot more spread out, and they are all on the same equatorial plane at precisely 35,876 kilometers above Earth. At this distance, the orbit speed will keep them aligned with the rotation of the Earth. These satellites will neither collide with each other nor come crashing back down to Earth. In fact, at the end of their life, these satellites use the last bit of fuel to push themselves at least 300 kilometers further into space, into what is known as a graveyard orbit. Recent developments make it possible to refuel and extend the lifespan of these expensive satellites. So the MEV was designed to rendezvous and dock and extend the life of satellites that were designed and built over 20 years ago. They were not designed with features that enable us to, to rendezvous and dock easily. Uh, but looking into the future, the MEV is really enabling a whole new industry in satellite servicing. Uh, and, and satellites going forward from this time forward will, will include features that will enable in-orbit servicing including features that, uh, for, for easily rendezvous and grappling the satellite, as well as things such as uh, refueling valves to enable us to refuel the spacecraft or power and data ports, kind of like the USB port on your computer that allow us to simply plug in new devices to either replace a piece of failed equipment or add some new features and capabilities to that spacecraft. And then looking even beyond that, it, we, we open up the capabilities, the possibilities for in-orbit assembly and manufacturing of spacecraft, uh, a whole new, whole new way to design and think about spacecraft in the future. Back in low Earth orbit, there is one more man-made object we must mention, the International Space Station, or ISS. The ISS is currently the only fully operational and permanently inhabited space station, but China, India, and two private companies, Axiom and Bigelow, are planning their own space stations. The ISS is made up of several modules with contributions from five space agencies, NASA in the USA, the European Space Agency, Japan's JAXA, the Canadian Space Agency, and Russia's Roscosmos, who launched the first module in 1998. The main purpose of the ISS is to run experiments in microgravity, astronomy, meteorology, and biology, and to test spacecraft for future Moon and Mars missions. It orbits at 400 kilometers from Earth, completing a full orbit in only 93 minutes. Crew of the ISS will typically spend five to six months on board, which can provide a good indication of what happens to body and mind when spending prolonged periods of time in space. To date, 244 people have visited it, including private tourists. I think the overarching objective of the International Space Station was to create an orbiting laboratory that we could develop the science, the engineering, uh, the general knowledge to increase the human presence throughout the solar system, starting with the moon, onto Mars, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But it's, it was also an opportunity for nations to come together and cooperate <laughs> in the awe and wonder of space exploration. And so uh, 15 nations built the International Space Station. Some of these nations weren't always the best of friends. Some were on opposite sides of the Cold War, opposite sides of the space race. Some fought wars against each other, uh, but somehow they found a way to set aside their differences and do this amazing thing in, in space and build probably the most complicated complex structure ever built and build it in space. And uh, I think it's not only a shining technological um, example, but it's also a shining example of what we can do as a species uh, when we engage in international cooperation. The ISS is regularly serviced by a variety of international and commercial spacecraft for cargo and crew. The first private company to supply the ISS was Northrop Grumman, who deployed their Cygnus cargo ship in 2014. So Cygnus is one of the cargo spacecrafts for the International Space Station. Its goal is to provide the commercial services to, to Space Station for logistics. So deliver supplies, anything from food, water, air, science, hardware, spares, anything you can think of 
to the space station. And then we spend time at the space station to basically facilitate the crew having time to remove the cargo and then put in whatever cargo they've already used. So essentially your trash from can parts uh, to science that it's already completed and failed. So then that is the sort of part that we do for disposal. And then at the end of the mission, we tend to do some secondary science objectives for different customers and for NASA. A Sapphire Fire experiment for NASA Glenn, CubeSats for two commercial companies, and then some other experiments for NASA as they come. Like we've done a few re-entry uh, observations for NASA in terms of being able to observe and collect data for, for re-entering the atmosphere. So we do this sort of cradle to grave uh, logistics for the space station. Let us now leave Earth's orbit. Our next destination is the moon. Exploration of the moon began in 1606 when Galileo pointed his telescope at the moon for the first time in history, discovering mountains and craters. The physical exploration began much later in 1959, when the Russian probe Luna 2 made a hard landing on the lunar surface. This was followed by the United States Apollo mission, landing a dozen humans on the moon. Recently, China has focused a bit more on lunar exploration, with two orbiters and two landers sent to the moon, including the first unmanned mission to the far side of the moon, and the recent return of lunar rock samples, the first in almost 50 years. But when will humans make a return to the surface of the moon? The goal of the lunar program Artemis is to land humans on the moon by 2024. This program is a collaboration led by NASA with support from many space agencies and private partners. Perhaps a better question is, why would we? One good reason is that the moon is the next step to Mars. While the moon is quite far, it is close enough to have near synchronous communication with Earth and for Earth-based ships to get there relatively easy. The goal of the Artemis program is to establish a permanent base camp on the moon. The technical and scientific knowledge gained from building a lunar base will ultimately take us closer to landing humans on Mars. And a secondary goal is for us to learn more about the lunar surface and potential resources available on the moon. This will all be made possible by a host of new technologies and programs. First, the Orion spacecraft, the successor of the Apollo spacecraft, which is how humans will get to the moon. The system is similar to the Apollo mission, with a crew capsule and attached service module. The spacecraft is powered by the Super Heavy Lift Space Launch System. Next, the Lunar Gateway, a space station orbiting the moon, the first outside low Earth orbit. This will act as an intermediate step between Earth and the moon. It will also be the base station for transfers to and from the lunar surface. SpaceX is developing the fully reusable Starship HLS, which will be used for this final leg of the journey. The timeline for Artemis is an autonomous mission in 2021, a crewed lunar orbit in 2023, the launch of the Lunar Gateway in 2024, followed by a crewed mission to the surface of the Moon. This mission will land the first woman on the lunar surface. In addition to this, the Artemis program will allow other commercial partners to send payload to the moon as part of the commercial lunar payload service. Now, let us go further. Mars is the next natural step in space exploration. As all other planets in the solar system are inhospitable, either because of extreme temperatures, toxic dense atmosphere, or lack of a solid surface. Mars is a barren planet with a very thin CO2 atmosphere and a soil which will be toxic to life as we know it. But there is evidence that three and a half billion years ago, the planet had a dense atmosphere and had liquid water on its surface and potentially life. All of this disappeared. Understanding why and how is important. Water ice remain on the polar caps of Mars and we would also like to discover if liquid water is present under the surface. Compared to a trip to the Moon, missions to Mars are considerably more difficult and complex. This is because of the greater distance, the higher gravity, the presence of an atmosphere and the sandstorms. Roughly half the missions sent to Mars have failed, but there have also been remarkable successes. In 1997, NASA's Mars Global Surveyor reached Mars orbit and began mapping the planet. 
and rovers were landed on Mars surface beginning in 1997 by NASA and ESA. The most famous one was the rover Opportunity, which remained operational on the surface of Mars for 15 years after landing in 2004, far exceeding its 90 days mission. There are currently eight satellites in Mars orbit. On the surface of Mars, we have the stationary lander InSight and the two rovers Curiosity and Perseverance. Perseverance landed in February 2021 and includes a flying drone called Ingenuity. Its purpose is to search for evidence of ancient life on Mars, test for possible oxygen production on Mars, collect surface samples and dig to collect deeper rock samples. Another important mission coming up is the ExoMars mission scheduled for 2022. The ExoMars mission has two science elements. The lander has its own instruments and will study the atmosphere and the geophysics of the landing site. And then there is a rover called Rosalind Franklin. Its objective is to look for signs of life. And it will do this in a new and unique way. The ExoMars rover is equipped for the first time with a drill able to reach two meters into the subsurface to collect samples. And this is very, very important because on Mars, the ionizing radiation that comes from the center of the galaxy penetrates through the atmosphere into the ground and it acts like million little knives that destroy the organic molecules, the telltale signs of the presence of life that we would like to discover. There are two ways in which we can look for signs of life on Mars. One is to search for physical evidence of the past presence of organisms. Another very important source of information regarding uh, the existence of life on another planet is chemistry. We can look for the biomolecules that are the functioning elements that make uh, a microorganism tick, the ones that are used in its metabolism. And this is one of the main objectives of ExoMars. And the next step in this quest would be to try to return samples to Earth, because on Earth we have access to much more performant instruments than what we can embark on a robotic mission. I expect that there will be a 100% chance that we will find organic molecules on Mars also because Curiosity has already seen them. I give it a 50% chance that we may find something that is suggestive, that perhaps there may have been something that is a candidate microorganism. ESA and NASA are working together on the next step, which is landing a mission on Mars that brings with itself a very large rocket that we launch back to Earth samples so that we can recover them uh, on our planet. This is a much more complicated mission because it's, it's a two-way affair. And in fact, it requires two very large launchers. One takes the lander with a rocket that will return the samples back to Earth. And another launcher carries a large orbiter that will rendezvous with a sample once it's launched from Mars, pick it up, and then come back to Earth where a capsule will be released and land uh, so that we can recover the samples. The most complicated part of any of these missions is returning physical samples from Mars to Earth. This has been done adhering to the Planetary Protection Protocol which ensures that any spacecraft going into Mars is sterile and does not carry bacteria, which could wipe out potential life on Mars. Sterilizing the spacecraft also prevents a false positive when looking for life there. And similarly, when returning samples from Mars, maximum safety is needed to ensure Martian life, if any, does not contaminate Earth. NASA actually has a planetary protection officer whose job is to ensure all of these safety protocols. 
This is nothing compared to some of the challenges that humans will face on the journey to and from Mars. We still have to solve many issues before we can send humans to Mars. The first one is radiation. We estimate that with two or three weeks on the surface, an astronaut would accumulate on that single trip the entire allowable radiation dose that is supposed to experience through its uh, whole career. We, we need to provide uh, protection and usually this involves either metal shielding or water shielding. But this is complicated because anything you launch is mass that you have to haul up and it's therefore expensive. Another important problem we have is that they have to carry with themselves everything they need in order to survive. What they drink, what they eat, what they breathe, and fuel for their return. If we think of what the Apollo moon missions did, that is a mission that lands where the astronauts stay on the surface just for a, a few days, this is fine, we can do it. But if we are talking of a long-term mission where they land and perhaps explore for a year, then all this food and water and air becomes a real problem. Then you really need to start thinking about trying to synthesize or construct uh, the food or the fuel or the water from uh, elements that you may find on Mars. And typically, the first thing that comes to mind is to extract this from the atmosphere. For later, if we think of uh, bases that may be on the surface of Mars active for many years, then you really have to start thinking about uh, the infrastructure. And another thing that we need to solve is how do you land different elements of a possible base very close to each other? Today, the best we can do is uh, we have a, an accuracy in the order of seven to 10 kilometers when it comes to, to landing uh, pieces of a station on Mars. And that is too far away. We need to be able to land modules really, really close to each other so that we can start thinking of building something large. But what about other planets? Have we explored them? Let us review in order from the Sun outwards. Mercury is the planet closest to the Sun. NASA's Mariner 10 did the first flyby of the planet in 1973. A messenger orbited Mercury from 2011 until 2015. ESA's Baby Colombo orbiter was launched in 2018 by an Ariane 5 rocket and will reach Mercury's orbit in 2025. The next planet from the Sun is Venus. There have been dozens of missions to Venus, with one currently active orbiter from Japan's JAXA. In 1975, Venera 9 became the first spacecraft to orbit Venus, and also deployed the lander, which gave us the first picture ever from another planet. After Mars, there are four more planets in the outer solar system. These planets all have several moons, some extremely large. Some are potential hosts of life. Jupiter is the largest planet in the solar system, made primarily of hydrogen and helium. Jupiter was first approached by NASA's Pioneer 10 probe in 1973, followed by several more missions in the 1970s. The probe Galileo entered Jupiter's orbit in 1995, sending back information that allowed us to learn that 90% of Jupiter's atmosphere is hydrogen. The orbiter Juno is currently exploring Jupiter and both NASA and ESA have missions planned to explore Jupiter's rocky icy moon Europa in a search for extraterrestrial life forms. Beyond Jupiter, the gas giant Saturn has been explored by several orbiters, most significantly by Cassini, which revolutionized our understanding of the planet during its 2004 to 2017 orbit. Beyond Saturn are the ice giants, Uranus and Neptune. These are the farthest planets from the Sun and the coldest. Both have several moons, and both have been visited only once by the same probe, NASA's Voyager 2 in 1986 and 1989, which revealed the presence of unknown moons and a ring belt around both planets. And now we are leaving our solar system.
The Voyager program is one of the most impressive and significant in the history of space exploration, and it takes us to the furthest from Earth. Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 are the two robotic interstellar probes launched in 1977. They've been traveling since then, and they are currently in interstellar space. Voyager 1 left our solar system in 1980, taking a final family portrait on the way out. This is the first image of the solar system as seen from outside, including a distant image of Earth known as the pale blue dot. At 22 billion kilometers away, Voyager 1 is the most distant spacecraft from planet Earth. Voyager 1 is currently traveling at 60,000 kilometers per hour and is expected to remain operational until 2025. At that time, its power source will run out and its instrument and telecommunication will switch off nearly 50 years and 25 billion kilometers after leaving Earth. Both Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 carry a golden record with encoded images, sounds and descriptions of life on Earth in case the probe is found by intelligent life forms. In 2006, NASA launched the New Horizons Interstellar Space Probe on an Atlas V rocket. The New Horizons holds the record for the fastest object ever launched from Earth. It is the first spacecraft to explore the dwarf planet Pluto, and in 2018 it confirmed the existence of a hydrogen wall at the edge of the solar system. It is currently headed towards interstellar space. But can we go further? We now know a lot more about our nearly 14 billion year old universe, especially thanks to projects such as the Hubble Telescope. Launching to low orbit in 1990, it has permitted great discoveries such as the age of the universe and the prevalence of black holes, which were only a theory before. It allowed us to evaluate the mass and size of the Milky Way. The images the Hubble returned us are truly awe-inspiring, such as images of remote nebulae, stellar explosions, galaxies merging, and images of thousands and thousands of galaxies. In addition to this, the extraordinary James Webb Telescope is scheduled to be launched at the end of 2021. It will be considerably lighter than its predecessor and will be able to detect objects that are further and older, effectively giving us a picture of the early universe, which in turn will further our understanding of how galaxies and solar systems were formed. Unlike the Hubble, which orbits at 500 kilometers from Earth, the James Webb will orbit at 1,500,000 kilometers. So, can we go further still? Given the actual physical distance and theoretical limits of the speed of light, going further is challenging to say the least. But the Breakthrough Starshot program is attempting to do exactly that. The plan is to send tiny sail-equipped laser-propelled robotic probes to Proxima b. Proxima b is a potentially life-supporting world in another solar system, around 4.2 light-years or 38 trillion miles from Earth. Using Earth-based lasers to propel them at 20% the speed of light, the light sails could reach Proxima b in 20 years, rather than the 20 to 30,000 years a traditional probe would take. Returning the signal to Earth would take around four years. We have always gazed skyward and reached for the stars, but why? The drive for exploration has always imbued the human spirit. As the ultimate frontier, space provides a unifying quest for all of humanity. In the history of the universe, we have existed for a blink of an eye. But in our brief existence, our intelligent mastery of our surroundings has demonstrated that we can prevail and thrive even in the most challenging circumstances. Is our species destined to escape even the very fate of the planet that originated us? The fate of our solar system? Profound questions which, by their very nature, won't have answers for a very long time. For now, the results of space exploration are aimed back down at us, at making our life on this planet better. Seen from space, Earth is this beautiful blue ship traveling through the cosmos, and we are all on board it. We coexist, or at least we try. Are we manifesting our best potential? Can thinking about Earth from the space perspective change how we think of our gravity-bound existence? So when our six-month mission was complete and we returned to Earth uh, in our Soyuz capsule, 
uh, we hit the ground so hard under the parachute that we bounced, we rolled, we flipped over, and out of my window, uh, which was now pointed down at the ground because we landed on our side, I saw a rock, a flower, and a blade of grass. And I remember thinking to myself, I'm home. But what was really interesting about that thought and what I realized right away was I was home, but I was in Kazakhstan. And so to me, that at that moment, my home wasn't just Houston, Texas, where my family was waiting for me to return. My home was Earth. And our definition of that word home has profound implications for how we problem solve, how we treat each other, how we treat our planet. And what I realized right away was broadening our definition of the word home does not come with it a requirement to forget where we came from, our national, our political, our cultural identities. It simply means seeing those things in the context of the bigger picture. There are many commercial operators working on creating a space tourism industry from scratch. Virgin Galactic and Blue Origin are the most prominent developers of private spacecraft capable of reaching orbit. However, these are still costly, complex, and out of reach for most people. But if humanity would benefit from more people seeing Earth from space, how can this be accomplished? The Space Perspective team is attempting to solve this problem with a unique way of undertaking a journey to the edge of space, above 99% of Earth's atmosphere. We are able to do this with a space balloon. So we have a pressurized capsule where eight people and a pilot are propelled to space very slowly and gently by a huge space balloon that is the size of a football stadium. And it's the kind of technology actually that NASA has used and other government entities around the world have, has used for decades. So it's also very tested and safe technology. And so we're going to be taking people on these six hour journey up to space to have this extraordinary experience and splash down and come ashore so that they can come back with this life transforming experience of seeing our Earth in space. As it turns out, we are not in the middle of a new space race. Rather, we are in the middle of a new era of space collaboration and radical innovation. But it might be argued that the space race was never over, as all the current progress builds on decades of impressive scientific and technological progress, achieved beginning with the Apollo program. Space exploration represents the pinnacle of achievements of our endless human ingenuity. Let us continue our journey to the stars and beyond. If you'd like to learn more about any of these issues, Check out the link below or visit www.rationalmind.show for more information and resources.